as as was mentioned, uh, my name is Alon Orlev. I'm a skull base and cerebrovascular neurosurgeon. I really want to thank uh, Dr. Cobbs, uh, Dr. Charles Cobbs, and Dr. Uh, Zach Litvak for for doing this uh, uh, great course and for inviting me to to speak, and also for being my mentors last year, of course. Um, so I'll uh, dive right into it, and I'm going to talk about um, sur uh, surgical biopsy of challenging uh, neoplastic skull base lesions. I'm mostly going to give you uh, a few examples. Um, See if I can trying to move this forward. Oh, there we go. Um, so the goals are to discuss um, the surgical complexity of attaining skull base um, uh, tissue samples when we need them. Um, uh, we're going to present some uh, examples, and we're going to present a little bit uh, contemporary minimally invasive surgical approaches. So um, let's see. Uh, there we go. So surgery for skull-based pathology. Um, many skull-based pathologies don't need surgery. Uh, they can be uh, diagnosed and often treated based on their location and imaging features, uh, commonly with radiation or observation if needed. Uh, at times, tissue biopsy or resection is required. A decision to pursue surgery is always weighed against the clinical burden from the lesion, the morbidity of the, of the surgery and the available treatment options. Uh, Skull-based surgeons must select the most su uh, suitable on the surgical approach, and we're going to talk about a few based on location, size, associated structures, and I'll talk about that a bit. And there's an ongoing effort um, really around uh, the globe where, by neurosurgeons to try and create minimally invasive uh, surgical approaches to decrease surgical morbidity. Uh, we surgeons look at things, uh, it's, it's a location-guided approach, really. Um, and we and the questions we kind of ask ourselves, assuming we need to do this, of course, is as I mentioned before, can I approach a lesion without disrupting the brain? Can I approach a lesion without endangering skull-based neurovascular structures? How much tissue is required? Do I need a biopsy, debulking, or resection? And what additional associated um, risks are there? CSF uh, leak, bleeding, post-op infection, among others. And these are things that we uh, contemplate when we kind of decide how to go. Uh, this is just a, uh, a picture of uh, the very crowded skull base with all the neurovascular structures. These are all things that we uh, deal with when we uh, when we're diving in there. Um, and there's another uh, there's another uh, um, drawing that kind of um, shows some of the skull base approaches that we have when we're going midline the endoscopic and the nasal approach, which we're going to see some uh, some videos of as kind has of, done a a, long, a very long way in terms of what we can do with it, and we'll see some examples. And there's, and when we go to the CP angle or or to the posterior fossa, we have some uh, lateral or posterior lateral approaches, um, uh, either midline or or retrosig or far lateral. And those are kind of our ways or our major avenues to the skull base. And I'll show some of those and a few others. Um, so uh, we're going to dive into cases, um, if you may. The first one is the um, um, the first one is a case we did uh, back at Swedish. Um, and I assisted um, uh, Dr. Anna Nisley, who's both my friend and also my uh, was my rhinology mentor last year um, in this case. So there's a 70-year-old male that had, had a very complicated history of chondrostar coma requiring uh, leg amputation and also fibrous dysplasia. He was followed for over a decade for a stable clival lesion, uh, known follow. And he, he presented um, with increasing headaches, left cranial six uh, palsy, causing double vision, and the MRI showed um, uh, replacement of the clival and bassy sphenoid bone marrow with an expensatile and heterogeneous uh, enhancing process. The mass had grown substantially, um, and it was uh, compressing uh, the left six nerve in uh, Dorella's canal. I'm going to show some. This is what it looked like. Uh, pretty nasty mass lesion uh, in, the, in the clivus, um, um, in the sinuses, in the sphenoid sinus, and in the and what's important is noticing that in the clivus it goes quite uh, quite laterally on both sides, and that was the major thing that we were that we were uh, trying to deal with uh, the fact that it was uh, replacing the the anterior um, petrous ridge and its inferior portion, and and that's why we presented also with the sixth nerve palsy. Um, so this is what we were after, and I'm going to show you just a a short portion, uh, just a a minute long maybe clip of, uh, and I hope this shows well, it should. Um, and and this is when when we're in there already, of course, and uh, after we did the entire approach, um, again, I'm, I'm assisting Dr. Nisley here, and, and we're working at a um, thankfully pretty soft tumor that is all entirely in the clivus, 
But as you can see, and this is what I mostly want to show, is that we can go quite lateral within uh, the, not just anteriorly, in, in, not just posteriorly through the nose into the clivus or what's in front of us. We can actually work behind the carotid, both the um, both the petrous and paraclival carotid, which is what you can see here using um, angled endoscopes, angled instruments, and uh, angled dissectors and, and angled suctions. We're actually uh, working behind the paraclival carotid in order to resect some of this tumor. This here we're working on the right, and we did a lot more working on the left in order to try and uh, decompress this. We knew we were not going to get a complete resection. This was not deemed possible, but we wanted to to decompress as much of it as we as we can in in order to uh, um, allow a safe um, radiosurgery treatment afterwards. So um, so this is what we did. And and I want, and again I mostly want to show you how lateral we can go. Um, so this is um, this is the post op MRI which shows uh, our resection cavity. And as you can see on the left, which is what we aim for, we went quite a bit quite lateral um, uh, as we had hoped, and we were able to uh, decompress a fair portion of the tumor. Unfortunately, the patient was um, was quite sick. This is uh, the coronal view of the post op MRI showing um, uh, similarly what we had done. The pathology came back, uh, chondrosarcoma WHO grade two. He underwent five fractions of cyber knife radio surgery, which when you do surgeries through the nose like that, and, and they're minimally invasive, the patients can heal pretty well and go home early enough and, and get uh, uh, additional treatment pre, uh, pretty early. And that's a, that's a great thing uh, because that's obviously a major part of the treatment. He continued to suffer from neurologic decline uh, in the months post-op and he eventually succumbed to his, to his disease. Um, so this was the, the first case I wanted to show you. Um, the next ones are going to be more hopeful. Um, so this is an optic nerve lesion. Um, uh, a bit of an abnormal case again. Again, we're looking at the zebras uh, this morning. Um, this is a 22-year-old male with a known supracellular lesion compressing the optic nerves that presented five years earlier uh, at, when he was 17 with an acute visual decline following hemorrhage in, in the cellar and supracellular area. Visual uh, deficit originally partially resolved, and the patient was followed uh, with visual and radiographic studies for five years. He was doing okay, but then after five years, he had recent decline in both visual um, in in his left visual field, and the lesion seemed to be expanding a tiny bit. Um, he was recommended a transcranial biopsy in a different hospital, and he presented to uh, our ED um, with acute level uh, left eye vision uh, loss. And an and acute headache um, before he had undergone, obviously, any biopsy. Imaging showed um, lesional hemorrhage, another lesional hemorrhage. Again, the presenting one was five years earlier and left optic nerve compression. Then we sat on it for a few hours contemplating what to do because we didn't know whether um, the tumor that is, uh, in, that is uh, encasing or part of the optic nerves uh, has bled to the point that it will not help surgery, or by doing um, some surgical uh, debulking, we can actually help this acute visual loss. We realized that obviously the tumor bled, but we didn't know whether we can really help this guy. After contemplating a bit, um, we decided to take him for an urgent hematoma decompression uh, um, hem um, and uh, and uh, via an endoscopic and nasal approach. Um, so I'll show you. So this is the lesion. This is the MRI done a few months before he presented. This is um, uh, probably from this past summer, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So this has been mostly stable, maybe growing a little bit over five years. And, uh, and again, it's a supercellar, uh, cellar and supercellar lesion riding uh, above uh, the pituitary and compressing or, or overtaking the optic nerves. Um, and this is what he presented with. Obviously, the, uh, this is the head CT scan showing that the lesion had hemorrhage and this is what we were contemplating, whether we can help, really help this guy. Uh, thankfully, we did. Um, so again, this is this is uh, recent, I, um, from uh, about four months ago. I hope you see them. Um, so uh, tuberculum cella, ICA, optic nerve, um, and the endoscopic. Now uh, we're actually uh, we're drilling um, the cella. This, uh, this surgery I did together with. Um, with my partner, my rhinology uh, partner, and um, who I do all these surgeries with, Ethan Sudri, um, here in Israel. Um, and partnership is crucial, obviously. We're opening the dura here over the cella. 
um, and you'll see we're gonna uh, we're gonna reflect the dura superiorly, and then we're gonna see the pituitary gland, and we're gonna need to transpose that a little bit in order to get above it, and you're gonna see that in a second. So we're seeing the pituitary, we're seeing the diaphragm. The diaphragm is kind of bulging. Now we're transposing the pituitary as we try and approach uh, on the left and superior side. Um, now. Above the pituitary, we're trying to work at the tumor, uh, bringing in, it had a capsule, which was which was difficult initially until we actually popped it. And then we started uh, being able to resect some of this tumor. Again, we're working supracellar uh, above the pituitary, trying to obviously preserve the stalk, which we, is, uh, is right behind there. And we're, uh, and we're slowly removing some of this tumor, knowing that we're gonna get a biopsy and not resect it all. Obviously, it's uh, it's part of the optic nerves itself, and thankfully here you see I'm taking blood clots from the left uh, superior region, which uh, I was content about because I realized that you know by removing these clots I'm decompressing the pressure off the optic nerves. Um, so, uh, and again, we're trying to uh, maintain the pituitary, although we needed to transpose it um, when we're working right above it. So, um, so this was. Uh, this was the surgery. I hope I can advance it now. Yeah. So uh, the post-op MRI showed with, that we got what we wanted. We were mostly on the left. We managed to decompress uh, the supracellular uh, region. And, uh, and as you can see, the pituitary, as we did see in surgery, also remained, uh, at least anatomically intact, it also remained uh, working, thankfully. Um, so post-op improvement in the left uh, visual decline, immediate, because we just decompressed uh, the, the blood clots from there. He continued suffering from some visual deficit that improved over the next following weeks. He was discharged on POD3, no DI, normal pituitary function. His pathology, as expected, was a pilocytic astro, WHO grade one, no elevated mitotic activity, KI67, which was low, uh, negative mutations, uh, P53 and negative IDH1. And unfortunately, minimal uh, uh, BRF positivity, which we were hoping some of these, as we know, uh, do have BRF positivity, positivity, and therefore we can treat them for that, but uh, this was not. Um, he's doing well. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, now I'm gonna expand this a bit and talk a little bit about the boundaries of the endoscopic and the nasal approach. So the endoscopic and the nasal approach has been expanded over the past uh, decade and a half, or maybe more than that, as our surgical experience and anatomical uh, knowledge is gained. We currently lesions in the cavernous sinus and ones encasing the ICA can commonly be safely removed. And I show the first uh, case that we work behind the ICA. Uh, EA access to lesions that are lateral to the cranial nerves uh, three to six is often quite limited by these structures, of course. And then there's, so therefore we have complementary both open endoscopic approaches that we use in order to you reach lesions in the lateral cavernous sinus, medial, middle fossa, and petroclival uh, region. And that's what I'm gonna uh, dive into and show two, two, uh, um, two cases like that. So uh, one, I, uh, I was uh, fortunate to assist Dr. Litvak in. Um, there's a 22 year old male with an intermittent numbness in his left side of the face that had an MRI showed a Meckel's cave enhancing lesion. No visual complaints, normal uh, visual and ocular exam. He was considered for radio surgery, but then advised to undergo surgical uh, resection. And the decision was to proceed uh, by cran craniotomy, insertion of a lumbar drain, lumbar CSF drainage in order to uh, achieve brain relaxation, and then a pretemporal extradural approach to Meckel's cave. Uh, I don't have a video of that, but I do have, this is the pre-op MRI showing this lesion in the Meckel's cave uh, and, and um, and this is a great paper that, that describes this type of approach and other approaches. But this is, a, as I mentioned, a pretemporal approach in which we do a craniotomy. And, and uh, by relaxing the brain, we, we work pretemporally and subtemporally in order to reach uh, that region that I've mentioned, the Gazarian ganglion. Uh, the pathology, we, it, it went very well. Um, the patient uh, went home on POD3 with uh, sharp pain that resolved, mild post op left facial numbness. He, uh, the pathology was a trigeminal schwannoma. He was discharged on Keppra, of course, for seizure prophylaxis. And as, as uh, the main thing that we're concerned about when we do these approaches is uh, it's a temporal lobe um, that needs uh, to be moved out of the way as we as we approach this lesion. Uh, three months post-op vision uh, uh, visits are improved facial pain and numbness, mild residual pain, and suffered from some pain when opening his mouth and incisional pain. 
Um, this is the immediate post-op imaging showing that the, this tumor is gone. Um, this is uh, the two-month post-op imaging showing again that the two, that this tumor is gone. Uh, some minimal mild uh, temporal changes, but the patient was entirely asymptomatic to them and was doing, as I mentioned, was doing well. Um, I'm gonna talk about another case, one last case um, that shows a different lesion, similar region and a different approach. Um, this is a cavernous sinus and temporal lesion. Uh, again, another zebra. This is a 46 year old female, status post renal transplant to, due to reflux. And she's, uh, and she's taking anti-rejection treatment. She presented acutely to the ED with left cranial nerve six palsy that caused double vision. She, had an M she underwent an MRI that showed a cavernous sinus enhancement. And then she was admitted to neurology that did their entire workup with, and got CSF that was all negative. She was sent home with her sixth nerve palsy. She represented two months later with an acute third nerve palsy. Again, underwent uh, the, the entire slew of tests, which were negative. And three weeks ag later, again, with the left uh, facial uh, paresis, House Brackman 5. Repeat MRIs, I'll show you all three of them, showing this cavernous sinus enhancement. And, and the new uh, last one showed an intracanalicular ICA, sorry, IAC uh, facial nerve enhancement. Um, she had repeat, as I mentioned, three times she underwent the CSF workup looking because every time we thought maybe now that we have uh, more, uh, uh, more enhancement in the, in the skull base, maybe now something would come up in the CSF, nothing did. And therefore not knowing what it is and whether it's a, a tumor or not, we, the decision was to proceed with biopsy of the lesion. And we elected the, the TONES approach, a minimally invasive uh, transorbital. And I'll talk for a second about that and show it to you. So this is the first MRI showing a left cavernous sinus enhancement. And again, this is when she presented initially with the sixth nerve. Um, this is the, the second MRI about a, a month and a half or two later showed when she presented with the third nerve that shows that the enhancement in the cavernous sinus is much more prominent at this point. Um, and again, it's a lateral cavernous sinus and not a very simple to reach uh, uh, area. This is the third time she presented within a few weeks that shows the IAC um, enhancement, very mild IAC enhancement. But again, she presented with a pretty prominent uh, House Brackman 5 uh, facial. Um, and, uh, and so the transorbital neuroendoscopic approach was described recently in cadaveric studies and surgery. The neuroendoscope is used in similar manner to the endoscopic in the nasal. It offers a safe surgical approach to the medial temporal fossa, lateral cavernous sinus, anterior petrous ridge, and there are so, several published case series in the, within the last few years, resection of different lesions in that um, uh, from uh, in those region in that region using this approach. Um, this is a great paper that shows the difference uh, between what you can reach safely through the nose. Notice that you can uh, through the nose um, you can actually transpose the, the paraclival carotid a little bit and work and the anterior inferior um, uh, petrous apex. While if you want to work lateral to the Gazerian ganglion, then you should probably take the transorbital approach as we did here. Um, this surgery I did together with my uh, oculoplastic uh, surgeon partner. His name is Iftah Yassou here in Israel. And, um, and this is just a few pictures um, of, of what we had done. Um, so this is him, of course, doing the superior eyelid incision, as you can see over here. We lateral orbital wall is dissected, and he's retracting the um, the the orbit to uh, to uh, medially as I'm doing as I'm drilling. We expose the temporal uh, dura. Uh, we see the superior inferior orbital fissure. We see uh, the dura here, and we're continuing the superior orbital fissure exposure. And now we remove the edge of the bone. IOF exposure, as you can see here, and um, and now we see now we see the cavernous sinus V1 V2. And we see the temporal dura. I use a sharp knife in order to resect some of the medial temporal dura and to take it to, for biopsy and biopsy from the cavernous sinus between V1 and V2 very carefully. I insert your dural uh, graft uh, as an inlay and some bio glue sealant. And, uh, and that's how we, uh, we close this case. Um, this is uh, the, po the, the post-op CT, as you can see, we can, uh, we can see here the bone work that we did. And as you can see, we did a little bit of, we removed just a little bit of the, um, of the lateral orbital rim. I thought going in that this will help me uh, take some more of the, of the cavernous sinus uh, um, 
uh, lesion because it would allow the endoscope to go more laterally. It probably helped a little bit. I may not have uh, required it, I must say. Uh, it didn't bother the patient, she healed very well. Pathology was difficult, was interesting. Um, it was dural thickening with hypercellularity, no atypia, no hypermitosis, no signs of malignancy, minimal KI positivity. It was minimally positive staining for, as you can see, all, uh, CD20 and CD3, negative for everything. Negative for, you see all these other stainings, IgG, IgG4, no granulomas, no vasculitis. The path conclusion was meningothelial hypercellularity consistent with re a resolving inflammatory process. They couldn't put their hands on what it is. It was definitely not, uh, not a malignancy. Thankfully, with some more steroids, um, even though we did quite if, if a couple of courses before trying that, the patient did well with some steroids, no new cranial nerve uh, deficit post-op, and she was discharged on POD3, and her cranial nerve deficits are resolving. She's doing very well. Um, I'll conclude by, by just uh, mentioning that skull-based uh, lesions may pose a formidable uh, diagnostic and treatment challenge, as you can see. Previously, one inaccessible lesions uh, associated with high morbidity are now accessible using minimally invasive approaches. Uh, contemporary surgical approaches allow resection of these challenging skull-based pathologies while we uh, minimize neurovascular complications. And obviously, trained teams are crucial. I'll just finish uh, by by uh, if uh, by thanking again Dr. Cobbs, Dr. Litvak, and Dr. Nisley, my mentors from last year. Uh, thanking very, uh, my mentors from Johns Hopkins, um, Dr. Gary Gallia, Dr. Masaru Ishii, Dr. Niall London, who I did a lot of endoscopic and nasal work with, and of course, Dr. Rafael Camargo, who was um, my, uh, who I think taught me to be a surgeon. And, and my last thank you is to my uh, mentor, my teacher, my friend, and my chairman, Dr. Uh, Sagiranov, who allows all this and is letting me grow. Um, thanks. Alan, thank you uh, for a lovely talk, very elegant cases that you presented. And I think uh, you did an excellent job of demonstrating the importance of having multiple tools or multiple arrows in your quiver in order to approach the same area, depending on the lesion that you're managing. I'm curious for you know those of us who don't routinely do some of the transorbital work and, and those of us uh, on the line who may not have seen it before, if you could talk a little bit about the learning curve uh, with that uh, compared to doing endonasal work. Oh, gladly. Um, so I just mentioned uh, that um, I think similar to endonasal, to learning to do the endonasal work, um, a cadaver lab is mandatory and, 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 um, and very recently I've, I've, I've seen, I'm not part of them, but there are some courses that are popping up. Um, uh, there was, I think a recent course in New York that is teaching that exactly. I think teams, uh, working in, in a team together with an ocular plastic surgeon or someone who really knows how to do the approach, uh, the, the initial approach for you is, is extremely important. Um, I learned this by, uh, uh thanks to, to you and to SSF that, um, that allowed all this to, um, to uh, allowed me to learn how to do a lot of cadavers uh, work before actually uh, going in and doing it on the patient. Great. All right, we are gonna move on to